Okay, so let's bring that music down. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michael Markowski, and today we're going to be making a painting based on a painting by another one of my very favorite artists. And this week is all themed around that artist, the artist that is probably the most dearest to me of all, Tom Thompson. Tom Thompson is, if you're not aware of who Tom Thompson is, and I don't assume anybody knows anything about uh, the artists that we're talking about. Tom Thompson is arguably the most important artist in Canadian history. And uh, yesterday we began by making this painting. And we did this one relatively quickly. This one just in an, under about two hours. So if you're interested in painting this painting called Northern Lights from 1917, you can watch that video as well. Today we're gonna to be making two paintings, but we're gonna be making the same painting in twice, I guess you can say. Because what we're gonna be making today is we're gonna be making um, arguably his most famous painting of all, The West Wind. And you may have seen this painting on postage stamps, on Canadian currency, on umbrellas and t-shirts and postcards and posters and all over the place because this is one of the most iconic images in Canadian art history. Um, probably most people who grew up in Canada have seen this image at some point. They covered it in their elementary school art class. Um, or as I said, on currency and all that. On, I think it was on one of the the quarter or the loony. I can't remember at one point, but it's 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 been around the world. <laughs> it literally, it's traveled to. It, it was just an exhibition about five years ago in Russia. There was a traveling exhibition of Tom Thompson's work that went out there. Um, it caused. It was in a big exhibition in England in the nineteen mid 1920s and was well 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 received um so it's 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 sort of like you could insert this image on, it's on the cover of books when they talk about canadian art history etc so we're going to make this painting but before we get to that painting we're going to make this painting so this was the sketch that Tom Thompson made in Algonquin Park, which is a provincial park, a, a gigantic provincial park that's larger than some countries, in northern Ontario, where he spent most of his summers um, from about 1912 until he died in Algonquin Park in 1917, under various mysterious circumstances, on or around July 8th, 1917. All of the facts and figures that surround his death are all contested, including the date and time, what happened, who was involved, what, did anybody see it, did somebody cause it? All of it is contested. And not only that, almost every single fact about Tom Thompson's life is contested. So I'm sure that as throughout today's episode and the two others that follow it on tomorrow and Thursday, there will be people who will dispute some of the things I said. Now, I, um, a few years ago, was invited by the Tom Thompson Art Gallery in Owen Sound, which is very close to where Tom Thompson grew up. The, his namesake art gallery invited me to do an exhibition in honor of Tom Thompson's the 100th anniversary of his death. Um, so then I got really deeply involved in all the, the research and literature, films and artworks and everything that's been made about Tom over the past 100 years. And I'm also currently illustrating a graphic novel about Tom Thompson. So I wouldn't consider myself the authority on Tom Thompson, but I have had access to certain things that 
that actually no one else, very few, maybe besides the curator, has ever seen before. So I, I feel like I have some intimate connection to Tom Thompson um, that maybe uh, some other people don't have. So I feel like we can have a lot of fun. I can talk endlessly about Tom Thompson. So maybe before we... I do waste too much time just blabbing on. I want to let you know that there are outlines for both of these paintings that I did on the iPad. I use an app called Procreate. I just bring the app, the photo into the app, and then do a quick tracing of it. So if you want, you can um, print out the outline and then transfer it onto the canvas. And I've done that for all of the Tom Thompson paintings we're going to be doing today, tomorrow, and on Thursday. So if you want to get a head start on those, you're welcome to do that. So I'll just move the other ones out of the way. Now I realize today is going to be probably a little bit of a longer episode. And so some people may want to watch the first half and then watch the second half later on. That It doesn't... Uh, however you want to experience today's episode, or you could tune in just you know, go have a little lunch or dinner wherever you are on the planet Earth and then just tune in later on. Um, but uh, I think the reason why I want to show you, or, 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 or ideally you'd be painting along with me, the sketch that he made on location, likely sitting on the rocks right next to the lake, and we're not exactly sure which lake in Algonquin Park he painted this in, um, he did he did paint this with oil paint, so it's there's a little bit of a difference as to the way we're going to approach this painting as to the way that he did. Um, so he did this sketch, and then when he he would so he would spend his summers in Algonquin Park, and then he would go back to Toronto around November, and he would he had this very small studio that they called the Tom Thompson Shack that was behind this the studio building that his friend Lauren Harris built in Toronto and the, the building still exists. It's a private building, but it's a historical landmark and you can walk around the outside of it. Um, and so he would spend like November, December, January, February uh, in that little shack behind the studio building. It was the old carpenter shack that the carpenters used to build the studio building, which is right next door. And so uh, he lived in that shack he also then uh, shared a studio with his friend A.Y. Jackson um, the, s the winter before he painted this painting, I'm pretty sure. Uh, because at the time he painted this, uh, A.Y. had enlisted in the Canadian military and was probably on his way overseas or shortly therefore before World War I or when World War One broke out. Anyway, long, I, as I said, there's so much I could talk about here. So, um, let me see. Let's, I just want to show you a few links here. Uh, let's go to the Dropbox folder. So you'll see, if you click on the Dropbox link down below, you'll see all of these paintings. These are all paintings that we've already done. Some names are very familiar to you, probably, like Leonardo da Vinci, and some of them you've probably never heard of before. But I would strongly recommend, at the very least, checking out what's in these folders and deciding for yourself, hey, I want to... Because I try to create... Um, find artists who represent different styles, uh, different genders and religions and races, etc., and time periods as well so that everyone can find some avenue to get interested into making art. So if we click on the Tom Thompson here, and you see there's another 30 episodes yet to come down the pipelines if you're interested to know what we're doing in the future. So here's the, the images from yesterday's episode. And then here two and three are the paintings that we're gonna do today. Now there's two versions of the outline. One is a JPEG, one's a PDF. They're identical otherwise. It's just whatever's easier for you to print off on your printer at home or the Kinko's, FedEx, UPS store, your work or wherever else uh, you might wanna print that, uh, that outline from. So today we're just gonna look at these two paintings and then there are two outlines, right? And all of this is all available to you for free. So um, feel free to download them. You can 
color them in if you like or use them for the outline and give the, the outline to a friend to color in. So let's actually just, I want to show you a little bit about how to transfer this image onto a canvas. So let's, um, move that out of the way. And then I'm just going to kind of talk a little bit while we do this. So there's, there's two canvases. And then there's these two outlines that I've printed off on my printer here at home. And then I'm going to line them up and then put a little bit of tape on top, right? And it's ideally you sort of try to get it roughly um, uh, level, the horizon line. And then you see here I'm using some carbon paper. And there's a link to an Amazon link um, in the description below if you want to buy some carbon paper and have it mailed to you. You can get it usually at any art supply store. Uh, even fabric stores often sell carbon paper or graphite paper. They're essentially the same thing um, because people often transfer patterns onto fabric and then cut them out, right? So I think here I'm just beginning with the outline for the sketch. And let's just zip forward. Right, and that's what it looks like when you lift up the paper. You got your picture transferred to the image. Now I often will will draw out the other, I'll, I'll kind of extend those lines. And then here's the same thing for the, the finished version of the painting. And then ta-da, there we go. So by the end, you will have two paintings um, or two outlines for paintings that um, you can make paintings of. And I think it would be very beneficial for you to, if you're going to do this, to do both of them, but it's up to you. Maybe you just want to do the sketch, or maybe you just want to do the finished version of today's painting. I'm going to give myself a bit of a, a challenge to try to paint the sketch in one hour. And I'm literally going to set myself a timer because what I want to simulate is the urgency that uh, an artist might feel when they're painting outside in, like, as we call it, en plein air, right? Um, you, you may have heard that term, plein air painting which essentially just means outside painting or outside the studio, right? So you're in the open air. And this is a tradition of, of landscape painting that has only existed, you know, it probably, let me see, when would it have, it would have begun somewhere around the early mid 1800s really it coincides with the the invention of tubed pre-made paint because prior to that artists would go to literally a pharmacy the same place where you might get uh headache med medication or allergy medication you'd also get your blue and yellow and green pigments etc uh, so prior to that artists would go and get their powder and grind it together Around the mid-1800s, uh, companies started pre-making paint and then putting it into tubes that artists could squeeze out. So that way, artists didn't have to travel with this gigantic, like, alchemy set. And sometimes, often, they had assistants who were just grinding pigment for them. They could just put a few tubes of paint into their backpack and go for a walk or go for a canoe trip like Tom Thompson and paint all plein air, right? So I want to simulate what it's like to paint really quickly when the the clouds are moving and the temperature might be changing the light is changing how do you how do you deal with a situation where oh my goodness look how beautiful the sky is and there's look at that beautiful um clear sky and then you're painting for 20 minutes and whoa where'd all those clouds come from ah no there's a cloud over top of the now this changes everything what do i do right so that's why you want to be able to paint quickly to get as much details and information as possible onto the page. So let's just move our outlines off to the side. And it is, it's a hot day here in my studio as well. That's actually why I was a few minutes late because right before we went live, as always happens, the all my equipment just 
decided to um, <laughs> to reboot, which is always a little bit alarming. Um, hopefully, we have a consistent stream throughout the rest of the episode, and it got its um, its uh, bad vibes out of the way early, right? Same thing. Yesterday's episode, at the very very end, it cut off about. Uh, 10 minutes before I was finished. I didn't know it until the very end, but uh, anyway. So yesterday, what we did, and what I've been doing for a while now, is just using a warm yellow as a ground. I put the warm yellow down uh, because traditionally, artists would often paint on a panel, right? A piece of plywood, which is actually what Tom Thompson painted on. And... You know, plywood can have various different colors from various different kinds of trees, right? So sometimes artists, depending on where they were on Earth, might have different, you know, um, softer or harder woods, darker or lighter woods. You know, this is a, actually a very lightly colored wood. But artists would, would, who painted on um, a wooden support like this would sometimes add a, 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 a what you call a ground to it, like you'd paint gesso. Gesso is probably the most famous ground, right? And these canvases you get from the dollar store, or in this case I ordered from Amazon. This is a 9 by 12 size canvas, which incidentally is just a little bit bigger than the original painting Tom made. The original painting, I believe, is 8.5 by 10.5 that he painted on. So we're, we're just a little bit bigger than the, his original size uh, painting. But this is um, probably a piece of compressed cardboard that has been covered with pre-gessoed canvas, which is why it's white. Uh, most, when you, if you've, like, everyone's maybe heard of canvas before because you have canvas backpacks, people buy canvas tents, etc. And it certainly doesn't come white. It's it's usually. Let me see. Do I have? Really quickly, just show you. This is the this is the back side of a canvas. This is a, a painting that I haven't yet painted on, but here's a, a a canvas stretched over a frame, and this gives you an idea of what canvas generally looks like. I don't know what it looked like a hundred years ago, um, but it's usually the bit of this kind of off kind of uh, off-white, we would call this kind of maybe an unbleached titanium color. And so that would be the color of canvas, the raw canvas before we put like white gesso on it. So if we look at the painting that Tom made, oops, um, one thing that's kind of interesting is that we can see the 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 wood underneath the painting. If we zoom in close, you can see a little bit of the wood grain in here. So I'm not I'm not exactly sure if if this was it, like it's possible that he was painting on a panel that was lightly colored like this. And he added some kind of, uh, uh, not a varnish, but uh, artists often would use things like rabbit skin glue, like literally taking rabbit skin, boiling it down, and then taking the kind of fatty uh, uh, material that's left over, like you skim it off, and, it's, and then you would spread it often onto canvas, uh, sometimes onto panel, with the point is, is that it would help uh, the paint adhere to wood, but it might also keep it from expanding and contracting, which is a very big problem with canvas because it's fabric, right? And canvas can, you know, if, depending on your environment, it can be op getting, expanding and contracting, which is why paint cracks, or one of the main reasons why paint cracks, because the surface underneath is expanding and contracting due to humidity and temperature, or even light, really. Um, and then if and because oil paint dries to a so, like it, it turns into like a solid cracker like substance and if it if it's painted on something that is shifting 
it's going to crack, right? It's going to it's going to break. Whereas acrylic paint is much more stable, right? It's it's quite flexible, right? Uh, long story short, what I want to do is I want to try to um, paint these both of these panels with a bit of that same orangey color that we see kind of showing through the painting. If you just want to paint it yellow with this simple, I mean, maybe there's some of you who've been painting with me for uh, many, many months now, and 90% of the paintings we do, we just start with yellow. So I imagine there's probably a few of you who are like, what, what, we're doing a different, oh no, don't worry. The, the, the results we're gonna get are gonna be very, very similar. I just thought just for fun, it might be interesting for us to do something just a little bit different. So what I'm gonna do here is I just got my warm yellow and now I'm gonna squeeze a bit of warm red. You can see not that much onto the onto my um, board here um, or my palette, sorry. And then I'm gonna put a little bit of water in there. This is just gonna help it dry a little bit faster. Although with the temperature as it is in the studio right now, I don't think I'll have too much of a problem with that. So I'm gonna stir this up. And this is not a scientific uh, <laughs> um, kind of measurement that I'm making here. You can see how, how powerful that red is, right? You saw I had like maybe six to one yellow to red, and yet when I mix them together, it goes much closer to the red than it does to the yellow, right? Darker colors always transform the color um, much more quickly than lighter colors do. So we've got this kind of orangey color, which I think is a pretty good approximation if we kind of go back to, actually let's do this side by side. We zoom in to that color. You know, we're, uh, oops, let's see. Doesn't have to be exactly the same, but uh, let's see, can we get a patch of, yeah, I mean, if anything, maybe I would want even a little bit more yellow in there. Um, but I think uh, I think that's probably good and close enough, right? As my grandfather used to say, good enough for government work. <laughs> Which I always, I didn't, had no idea what on earth he was talking about when I was like six years old and he would say that. Now I just think it's very funny. And I, but uh, um, anyway. So I'm just gonna take this paint and apply it over here. And it gives us just the the semblance of painting on a piece of wood. Now the, the actual larger west wind itself was painted on canvas. So, and I think if I just, actually let's just look at the other one and see while I'm doing this. I don't know if we can see any canvas showing through here at all. If anything, it looks maybe more like that uh, the canvas I just showed you that I have it here in my studio. So maybe, maybe it might be, you know what, let's, I, was, I wasn't gonna do this, but I think, because I, I mixed a lot of this paint, but I think I'm gonna mix uh, a color that is much closer to a canvas color for my larger paintings, so that, um, because I might be interested to see how the colors change with two paintings side by side with slightly different background colors. Now we've done that before in our whole 45 episode how to paint course, which is, um, you can find a link to that in the description below. And for, it's the, the painting, or the paintings that we did for Hilma Af Klint. Um, which I think was like episode five and six or something of that series. At the, we, we, 
because that's where I, I kind of started introducing the idea of prepping the canvas, putting a color down onto the canvas before you even start painting the picture. And so we did a little bit of a test where we, we took one canvas, divided it into four, and put different colors on the background just so you could see how those colors affect the overall painting. So I think we'll do a little that same sort of thing here again. Um, so this is this is gives us an idea again. It's maybe a little bit more on the reddish side of things, but I'm not too. I don't. I'm not worried about doing a complete 100% faithful reproduction of that. Just want to give us an idea. So where's this here? Actually, let's mix this other color. So this other color. I'm just going to mix it right on top of here is and let's if I get a panel here so you can see that color is it's a kind of a brown so I'm just going to take the same color that I had there before which is an orange which I made with warm red and warm yellow I'm going to take just a bit of that. Well, maybe a little. Actually, not too bad. That's okay. I was going to say, maybe I put a little too much blue in there. I'm not sure how it looks on camera. It looks maybe a little more orangey on camera. This looks a little, is, is more sandy color. I'm just going to add a bit of white to this. You want to be careful how much white you add to, to a color that you're going to use as your base color because white is a great color for covering up mistakes, right? So if you put a lot of it in there, you might uh, find it hard to see some of your pencil lines in there. So, which is why I'm going to add a little bit of extra, ooh, a little water in here. Because that's going to help thin it back down a little bit. And also, rather than adding more white to this, what it's going to do is we have a white canvas which we're about to paint on and so the white of the canvas is going to mix kind of optically with with our eyes it's going to because the color essentially exists in our brains in our eyes right or how we perceive color anyway so we can get closer to this rather than adding more white to it just by using the canvas itself and the whiteness of the canvas all right, so I'm just going to, again, now this is a little bit more on the reddish side. I could probably have put more yellow in it again. But I think just for our purpose here today, I think that's, that's good enough. Now, again, I'm sure there's some people that, that just based on how I normally approach things, painted it yellow. I wouldn't worry about that. And, I mean, if you wanted to get kind of closer to an, an actual painting on canvas experience, pre, you know, painting a color a, a little bit of an off-white like this would, would be a, probably a pretty smart idea. Now, most people, the vast majority of people, like painting uh, on canvas that has been gessoed. That, and gesso is usually 95% of people who paint will use a white gesso. There is black gesso you can buy. And there's also clear gesso, which you can buy. Actually, I um, this canvas, which you're looking at, is actually gessoed with clear gesso. So it's a... Uh, because I like the look of the canvas, as we see. Because um, I like the look of the, the paint or the, the, the texture, the raw canvas coming through in the paintings that I make for myself. But uh, anyway, so this is, yeah, I didn't do the best job mixing that color, but we're gonna paint over the whole thing anyway. So just something a little bit different for today because today is kind of, for me, a bit of a special episode. So let's just clean up this table just a little bit. I always find it 
it can sometimes be a little bit confusing when my work surface or easel is or wall or whatever wherever you're making your painting if it's really really dirty and there's splatters of paint everywhere it's sometimes hard to to just see your your canvas itself without being without the colors that are surrounding it kind of influencing the the colors that you actually see on the canvas um so uh here's these two side by side right let's uh just so we can see these two two colors right so this would be we're trying to simulate the raw wood color that he might have that he was painting the panels on in Algonquin Park here on the left and then this is simulating a canvas that he's he's painting over top of in his studio in Toronto so I'm gonna just quickly blow dry both of these and then we're gonna put some paint on the palette and I'll set my timer and we're gonna start uh, painting here so let's zoom out let's get that Okay, I see a couple questions in the chat there. Um, Heidi says, I seem to like the sketch better. You know, personally, and I'm not alone, there are many people who have that same opinion that the sketches have more vitality uh, than the original painting or the, the, the sort of more famous version of the painting, right? This is, again, this is the one that he did on location uh, probably, as I would imagine, in an hour or less. Versus this one, he probably spent weeks and weeks really refining every detail, trying to get... And it's also much bigger. This this one is sort of maybe like 30 by... by or maybe even bigger, maybe 40 by 50. You know, it's... it's they're... they're, they're their big paintings, whereas the sketches are much, much smaller, too. So that would also be a reason why it would take him much longer to paint those. Um, beyond the fact that I'm sure he was just taking a little bit, being a little bit more careful. Okay, so let's move this painting off to the side. And we're going to focus on... The, actually, and let's get some paint on our palette. So... Um, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to use, um, I think I'm just going to put all of my colors on the palette. It looks like he used, uh, a, a, you know, a lot of color. So... He, Tom Thompson also just as a you know, a, a, uh, a word of, um, of, I don't know what kind of a word it would be, but, uh, 
you know, obviously Tom Thompson was not using the exact palette that we're using. But virtually none of the artists that we've looked at have used the exact palette that I'm using. The palette that I'm using is something that... Um, I would say I t take all the credit for, but is definitely, you know, it's 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 um, something that uh, is is probably a little bit more unusual for a professional artists to do. A lot of times, artists will will buy like select tubes, you know, that have all sorts of fancy names on them, and uh, that are uh, much more limited in terms of the the possibilities of color that can be created than this some of these colors were not even available to tom thompson when he was painting all of the colors i'm using here are are synthetic pigments right they're all made by a chemist in a laboratory um, and it, they simulate the colors the actual organic compounds that are that most paint of the time would have been created with okay Whew. okay so i'm going to make this painting quickly so i'm just going to get myself hydrated here i just want to really imagine him seeing this scene and trying to to get it on canvas as quickly as possible So maybe right before we launch into the painting, let's just take a quick look at the painting itself and see if we can understand a little bit about how it was created. Like what was the order of paint that was applied on the canvas? Now, um, I don't know if he used a pencil to sketch out the scene or charcoal which is another common material. A lot of the times, what artists do is they actually just use one of their their existing colors on their palette to paint their lines in. And we did this um, when we painted the Berta Morisot painting, the flower, the vase of flowers in our painting uh, class last, when was that? Last October, I guess, right? Um, and what we did is we, we began with a painting like this that had an outline, but then we just we took another color, quickly sketched over it. I think that's how we did it. Um, and then we used that as the basis for the painting. So I think I'm going to do something very similar to that today. And the color that I think he's using is a brown. Like, I, I, I'm looking at this... And I imagine, like, this looks like a, a line that might have been put down very early on in the painting process. Right? That he might have sketched it out really quickly with a brown. Just to kind of get that tree in place. And we can see he used it here for the rocks. Underneath here. Um... And he might have done a little bit of that in the sky as well. There might be a, he might have used a slightly lighter color under here. So I'm going to try to to reproduce as best as possible the uh, the order that he he used here. And then I'm going to I'm going to paint it, and then I might even just wash my my palette off, and then do the second painting. So. Um, get let me see actually let's see if I can get a, a website up here that's like a timer okay um, let's see screen. No, we don't need to go full screen. I was hoping it might pop out or something. 
That's as small as I can get it. Okay, so... I like that, taking up so much real estate on the... So I don't have any other option on this computer. Um, maybe I'm not going to keep it on the screen the whole time. I'll put it off to the side, and you'll be pretty... You know, we'll, we'll start here in a second, so you can kind of get an idea of how we're doing for time. Okay. So... Are you ready? You ready to make a painting with me in one hour? But uh, one of the greatest paintings in, in Canadian history. Okay, so here I'll, let's move this back. Oh, come on, here. There we go. Okay, so now it's counting down. So uh, to get this brown color. Basically just what we just did. I'm going to take some warm yellow. Let's get a bit more of it on here. Some warm red. And a bit of blue, warm blue. You can make a cold blue or cold brown if you want just by using cold yellow, cool blue, and cold red. And the, it just looks a little bit more gray and a little bit more dull of a color. Now he probably had a color very similar to this uh, in his paint box. In fact, it might have been a little bit more like that. Okay. So, and then he probably would have taken a brush, probably about this size. a little bit darker and just a little bit more blue to it because I got quite a dark um, color for my palette anyway so make sure that it stands out on here so obviously I've already got my pencil lines drawn on here so I'm just going to kind of go over top of them so I imagine he's he's looking at this tree and you can see it kind of looks a little bit greenish on top of this um, red, kind of orangey uh, background. So he's probably looking at it and seeing, okay, I like this tree. So I'm going to put that in place first. And here's the, the foreground, the rocks. And then I think there's another tree here, a smaller one. So in fact, uh, oops, let's show these side by side so you can see. Right, and here's this. And then there's all these little branches and, and clumps of leaves and stuff, such, right? So this kind of thing goes really quickly, right? You're just trying to, to create your composition, like you're composing the foundations of your, of your, uh, the structure of your painting. And at this time, it might be a situation where you go like, hmm, is this tree in the right place? Do I need to move it off to the right or left or anything like that? He probably would have also put the little bit in the background. I don't know if he would have done too much in the sky. He might have seen like, okay, I got a few clouds kind of coming in. How these attach, I'm not exactly sure. But, you know, if you really think of like the purpose of a sketch is that it is intended to be used 
for a larger painting. And all of his friends who later formed the Group of Seven, and I saw that was a question, was Tom Thompson a member of the Group of Seven? No, the Group of Seven, that's that's a common misconception. That's a This is a great trivia question. No, Tom Thompson was not a member of the Group of Seven. The Group of Seven formed a year, or well, a couple of years after Tom died. And, so, and kind of in honor of Tom Thompson as well. In fact, the very first time the Group of Seven had an exhibition, they included Tom Thompson's artwork in the exhibition and had an empty chair that was intended to represent, you know, Tom, uh, for Tom, uh, to, to sit and be present in the exhibition, right? Which I think is like, a, is a pretty touching thing for a group of, of friends to do. Um, to help honor their, uh, to honor him after he died. So, I, you know, it's, it is kind of confusing because often you might hear Tom Thompson and the group of seven mentioned in newspaper articles and magazines. Literally, that's the title of many exhibitions. Okay, so we've got this laid out here. We're five minutes into the painting, and that would be probably what he would have started his painting with. Right, so he would have sketched it out really quickly onto the canvas, gotten to this point, and then now he's going to start mixing his colors. He may have already had his colors mixed on the palette. He, he would often, you know, he spent most of his summers in Algonquin Park. So, and not only that, the, the spring and fall as well. He would sometimes leave and go back to Toronto or to uh, some of the other towns nearby, Huntsville, Ontario, where um, Winifred Trainer lived. And there's some people who speculate there was a little bit of a relationship going on there between them. Some people go so far as to speculate that the two of them were engaged to be married. And some people say uh, Roy McGregor would, um, believes that not only were they engaged to be married, but that she was pregnant with Tom's child, and that caused all sorts of problems, and that Tom may have committed suicide because he didn't want the burden of being a father, um, or, or that he was murdered because he didn't, he was going to run away to Alberta um, to avoid having to take care of this child. There's, I mean, Tom left maybe 10 letters in his entire life. Um, he's, there were certainly no radio interviews or movies or films or, you know, he died before, you know, he had sold a couple of paintings to the National Gallery of Canada and what became the, uh, the Art Gallery of Ontario, the AGO. He, he had sold paintings to them, which was a remarkable feat for a person that had only been painting for a couple of years. Um, so he was moderately successful, uh, when he died, but it, it wasn't until about 15 years after he died that the, 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 all of the interest about him began, right? So by the time, by 50, after somebody has been dead for 15 years and people go back and try to remember and tell stories about them, people's memories are a little bit foggy, right? Okay. So let's see. I got 51 minutes left. Let's, uh, looking at our palette and looking at the original. Um, my instinct is generally to work from the back and go forward. So, and I, I would imagine Tom would have done something similar as well, because if you think about it, what is going to change most quickly? Is the tree itself going to be different in five minutes or ten minutes or three hours from now? Yeah, the light is going to be a little bit different on the tree. Absolutely. The light's going to be a little bit different on the rocks. But what is something that is going to be... If, if you sat down and you liked the sky right now, that would be something you'd want to paint immediately. Now, it's entirely possible he liked this tree and he looked at the sky and said, eh... I don't like that sky, but I love this tree. And decided to paint the tree and waited for a better sky to roll in. Or he was painting the tree right there 
and goes, oh, but I love the clouds over here, and then just turned and painted the sky in in the background behind the tree right there. Right? That's something I don't think people who, who don't paint might not understand that artists do that stuff all the time. Right? Like, even, let's say, this background. Like, who knows? Maybe there was... Um, uh, maybe the tree, maybe behind, maybe he loved this tree, but that tree was maybe facing in inland, and there was a hill behind it, and so he maybe he drew the tree first, and was like, yeah, but I don't want to paint that hill in behind, so he turned and faced the water and painted the water in behind the tree. We haven't been able to locate the exact location of it. There are. There are some signs. I know somebody's going to tell me, no, 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 there, I've been to Algonquin Park and I've seen the. there's a bench and a plaque saying this is where he painted it. That is all under dispute. There, there are, I've, I've read all, literally every book about Tom Thompson and there, for every book that somebody says this is where this happened, there's another book that somebody says, no, that's wrong, this is what happened. And then there's another book that says, no, both of those people are wrong. This is what happened. So, um, so let's. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna assume, just for the sake of things, that everything was in front of of him, and that he's painting exactly what he sees. Now, if I was in that situation, I would probably try to get the things that are moving most quickly if I like what I see. So I'm gonna paint the background in right now. So I'm going to take, I'm going to make a gray. So I'm going to take my warm blue. I'm going to take my, uh, oops, let's share this in the screen here. So I'm going to take my, both of my blues and mix them together because that's going to give me a dark color. Let's take our uh, cool red. And let's take some cool yellow since we haven't used any of that yet. If we mix this together on camera, that looks kind of greenish. So if we want it to be less green, what would we want to do? If it's if we see our gray looks very green, then that's telling us we have a lot of yellow and a lot of blue. So what is the other color that we can add to to re, to, to modify that? Is some red, right? We add red to that color, and it's going to pull it from the green side of things towards the neutral core, which is where our gray world lives. Okay, now obviously you can just use some black and white, and your problem is solved. I always think it's so much more interesting to actually use the colors that we have to make uh, the colors that we need rather than just going and buying colors okay so here's this is a, you know a bit on more on the bluey side of things if i add more red to it it's going to go a little bit more purpley and then i could add a little bit more yellow and you know it's it's always a bit of a balancing act and the point is i don't think personally to get exactly the same it's just to so you, we, I'm really, I, I want you just to play around with paint and have the experience of, of having a little bit of fun with painting. So let's uh, take this gray. And by the way, I got 47 minutes. And I'm gonna start kind of just painting these blobs of gray in here. And I'm, you know, especially because I'm moving quickly, I might not get all the colors in exactly the right, quote unquote, places, but I'll do my best. And also, I'm spending a lot of time blabbing away while that's happening. The other thing, too, if you're working back to front, you can always paint over what's in the background with your with a color in the foreground. That's why I really like working this way too is you're not sort of locked in whereas if you start with the foreground and then you paint a bunch of stuff there it's sometimes a little bit harder to modify things okay so then he's also probably going to sit there and go okay i've painted this 
cloudy, darker area here. Um, is there? Can I use this color in the foreground anywhere? And it looks like he might have painted th these bushes. I think he painted something over top of them as well, but he's, I'm just going to use the same color. I've got it mixed already. And I think it's a little bit darker here. So remember we mixed this as our darker version of the color. I'm just going to scoop a bunch of that out. Keep a little bit of white on so it stays a little bit darker. And then, look, he's painting this kind of foreground area here. Maybe he is also like, you know, I'm just going to get this background, this hill back here painted in. And then you see how he's leaving these like little gaps in between uh, where some of the colors, he like the tree branches. That's really important. Well, that's a little bit lighter color, so maybe I'll come back and fix that. Okay. Uh, anything else that needs this? Maybe there's a few of these up here. Okay. Next thing he might have said is like, okay, I got this color. I'm going to lighten it up significantly. So I'm going to add a lot of more white to this gray. And then let's get some of this down. So we got 43 minutes left. So we're doing pretty good in terms of time, right? Um, This kind of far shore has got similar kind of color here. And then he's probably looking a little bit into the water and seeing if I can find a few little places I can put those spots. Okay, looking around. In his case, he's looking at the sky or the or the or whatever he sees in front of him to try to find these details. I'm just looking at his, imagining it's a... I'm looking at the landscape. And then what I imagine he would do is then just continue this, take some more white, and I think you might have even got a little bit of brown on this white. It might be a little bit too much. So let's just, well, I'm gonna use this. I was gonna go for a lighter color, but he uses this color anyway. So rather than just saying, oh, I can't use it, let's see if I can use it in a few places where he did use it. So here's this color with a little bit of that brown, or you could just add a little bit of warm yellow, I suppose, into that. So 
So there's all these little tiny parts, like where he sees the the through the branches here, and that's it's kind of hard for me because I don't I, obviously I, I'm not there, so I'm not exactly sure what he's seeing. Before I move on, let's just see if there's maybe he sees this down here is having that same color. Okay. Next thing I'm going to do is maybe I'm even just going to wipe my brush off. I'm not going to clean it, uh, but I am going to. Um, I'm just going to now take this my white. I'm putting it over here. This just keeps the if I clean the brush, it's going to be pure, pure white. Well, there's nothing wrong with that. That might be just a little bit too shockingly bright. So, um, in fact, that is a little bit too bright. So I'm just going to take the same color I had before and mix it into my white. Now, it's possible that he used bright white, and then over time, this painting has kind of yellowed a little bit. Now there are these the the white on the white caps here, but I think that that would have been one of the last, the very very last things that he did. So I'm gonna likewise reserve that towards the end. It's also important, like you can see, I'm not using my biggest brush, but I'm certainly not using my smallest brush for any of this, right? Because we're moving quickly. If I was using a brush half this size, it would have taken me half the time or twice the time to do what I've done already, right? And that's just too slow. Okay. So now I'm just going to take a little, rub a little bit of that off. Um, if I was using oil paints, I might want to um, clean my brush or use a different brush. Let's just take some of this white. And I'm going to use my cool blue. Put that on here. And let's just mix this cool blue into with some white. Not sure exactly how dark we need to go, but um, and then let's put a bit of this in here. Now I'm I'm doing my best to to look up um, as frequently as possible um, to get as myself as close to his painting, but obviously there's going to be some changes that I make. I've got 36 minutes still on the clock here. So I'm doing pretty good with my time management as well. That's a, a big thing. Uh, when I talk to my students at Emily Carr, uh, the art college, the university I teach at, one of the main things I'm always talking about 
uh, as I'm sure they would tell you, is time management and how poorly most artists manage their time. And um, so you really want to try to be moving at a pretty good clip. Like this is, you know, if I'm painting on my own, this is about the speed that I'm trying to paint at, especially at this stage of a painting. Um, where is this here? So there's some some kind of con I'm kind of <laughs> I've lost a little bit of detail here, which it also kind of looks like he did as well, to be honest. Um, and now I look at this color, I think, I think I've got everything in here. Now, uh, his painting is actually a little bit smaller, right? This edge was not cropped in, or was not part of the painting, so I have to kind of add a little bit of extra um, on the edges there. So maybe I'll just... Do a bit of that. Okay, I think I think I've got everything that was in there. So maybe it's we're we got 34 minutes on the clock. Let's take a sip of tea. Hmm. <coughs> I took a big gulp there, a little bit too much. <coughs> okay. So I bet you he would, he probably would do something similar to what I'm doing, like get lock that all in, and then, and then say, okay, well, you know, I've got it enough of the sky done. What I need to do is, let's go back into the tree. Let's bring a bit of the tree back in. In fact, he he might have actually stopped halfway uh, here. Now that I'm looking at it a little more closely, but um, let's. I think what he would have done, <clears throat> we have this similar color here, is add a little bit of green into this painting, which we don't have just yet. And I'm going to mix a warm green, right, because this is going to be in the, in the foreground. So let's take some of our warm yellow and warm red, and let's mix that together. And, and I like this color a lot. <clears throat> this is kind of a grassy color. Kind of like your fall, you know, when the leaves start to turn red and the grass starts to die. This is a, a great color for that. But it's obviously way too bright, right? So we, ha we previously mixed our darker color, which was both blues, cool red, and cool yellow. So that's how we got that color. So I'm just going to take a bit of that and then just mix this color into this, right? So we're now just sort of, I mean, you could obviously add a little bit of this color into here, but because it's so dark, I'd much rather mix a lighter color, take a bit of this and mix it into that lighter color. So now we've got this very dark green, almost kind of like a racing green, I guess you could say. And then let's just now look for places where we can paint this. In fact, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, the painting is up here on the screen and I just want to, you can see when I'm, when I look up, I'm looking at the screen, you can get an idea of how often I'm looking up versus um, actually painting. All right, so, you know, kind of quickly look up and to see what is here and that might look a little bit red or sorry a little bit too bright green so i'm just adding a little bit darker color to it and um, it's a little bit light to that color so i'm just keep on darkening it in fact, I'm just going to go right into the darker color this time. That's closer to what I want. 
and I can also then just paint a little bit over some of the stuff that I might have put in there before. Right, so you can see how often I'm looking at that image. Right, towards the end of a painting, I'd st I almost stop looking at the image entirely and I'm just looking at my canvas. But at the early stage, all the answers are in front of you. Or for him, it would have been... Well, it could have been in any direction. Who knows which direction he was looking at. But I think a lot of the time, most artists spend the first while of their painting just looking at the canvas and then they wonder why it doesn't look like the apple or the face or whatever it is they're painting it's well because you weren't looking uh at the place that has all the answers which is the thing right in front of your face right um Okay, so I think that I've got everything it needs this green. I, I might have to go back and do another layer of green. Which is not surprising, right? We're building things up and then things might change, the light might change, and he might have begun this painting, really liked the colors that he saw, and then as the painting evolved, he was like, oh, actually, I like the color on the tree now. Oh, I gotta mix a different color for that. So, now I'm gonna move, I'm gonna do the, um, the water in behind here, which is a gray. I got 28 minutes, by the way. Um, so we've, I'm gonna need some more white. This white, and then I'm going to take a little bit of cold blue and just add that into the color. Take this darker color that I have here. Let's just see. It's actually not bad. I was going to say it's a little bit too dark, and then I look at his, and I think, well, maybe this is a little bit too bright, right? Mm, so I just noticed he was doing a few things in here. There's a few branches I missed, so just clean that out. And then if you're kind of fading this, what I would do is just add a little bit of that same color a little bit further down, or even up in that case, right? Okay. So let's, I'm gonna darken that again. Let's take a bit more of this cool blue. And as it's getting closer to us, we're gonna take some warm blue. And then taking our darker color and mixing that in there.
just do I need any of that? Might have been there. Okay, <clears throat> I think that's okay. Um, so he's got a green on the foreground here, but before I go into that, I'm just going to take, because I've got all this kind of gray, let's just continue along here. I'm going to take some of my cool red and my warm blue and mix this together. It's going to give me a bit of a purpley color, right? Let's add a bit of white to it. And I'm out of my dark color that I had mixed. So I think it might be worth just... Uh, I'm going to mix a bit more of that darker color real quick. I've got 24 minutes on the clock. This is this darker color. I'm going to paint over his name here and like paint it back in later on. Okay, let's take the lighter purple version here. See, there's a few strokes here that have got a lot of the, that magenta red in them. I like this purple that he's he's using in the foreground. I think that's kind of it's it's quite nice. Often, purple is one of those colors that doesn't get used much on the palette. Okay, so I think I'm going to now mix a brown again, this dark reddish brown. I'm just not even going to bother washing my brush. Let's take a bit more warm yellow. And I'm going to take a smaller brush. And I'm going to come back in here and see if I can bring a little bit of clarity back to this composition. Okay, so it's not dark enough, so I'm just going to add some of my darker color to my brown. So this painting is made in 1916. At this point, he's only been painting for about three and a half years. Right? He began really painting in earnest in about 1912. Let's, uh, this main part of the tree. Thank you. 
20 minutes on the button. You know, so there's all of these kind of crisscrossing lines. I'm probably getting them all completely mixed up. But it's... Uh, for him, this all of this would have been really obvious. Here, I mean, it's it's pretty hard for me to know what line is, is it going in which direction. So I'm kind of making things up here. Oh, there's my good friend Sam Davidson in the chat. Good to see you, Sam. <laughs> Sam wrote the music that is hopefully still playing in the background there. Okay. So I think... I think that's good, because he's then going to... He might have actually done more of this, what I just did, before he did more painting in the background. So, but that's something that you only really learn by doing exactly what we're doing here, is by actually trying to paint it again, and you, you, you learn a little bit about somebody's process. Which, speaking of my good friend Sam there, you know, it's much more, like, more common, obviously, for musicians to learn by playing music by other musicians right you learn by playing mozart or the rolling stones or whatever for whatever reason visual artists decide like oh you know what i'm gonna just i don't i barely know anything i'm gonna reinvent the wheel myself and you know it sometimes works for some But that's not the case traditionally. Traditionally, artists would do exactly what we're doing. Would would learn, study from the masters. Okay. So let's get this green in the water in the foreground in here. It looks like he took this same warm blue that we used with warm yellow. I think and then added some white to it. Now the genius of Tom Thompson is that he's painting this green in the water in the foreground and he makes it look like water as opposed to grass on a field here, right? So, I mean, it's nothing short of like amazing some of the effects that this guy was able to achieve. Obviously mine, I'm not quite capturing exactly what he did, even though I'm doing very similar <laughs> marks than he did, right? It's but the other thing, the feature of Tom's painting that you could see is we could see this gr the the red, the orange shining through here, and then these these marks that are going over top of the background. Right, so there's this constant interplay between foreground and background. Okay, so I got that color. I'm gonna just take it and go cool blue over top of some of this and try to integrate it a little bit better. Now that's a little bit more of a neon color.
Okay, I got 15 minutes and 13 seconds on the clock remaining. Um, anything else here? I'll just do a little bit with a bit more white on there. Okay. Let's go um, into this foreground here. So with the foreground, I'm going to need some more warm blue, right? Because we're getting close. The closer we are to the foreground, the warmer colors we should be using. Technically, according to just the tradition of painting. Now, you can disobey those uh, those so-called rules. There's no... Um, but uh, Tom looks like he was obeying some of those rules. Uh, so we'll try to follow them as well. Okay, and he's probably taking that this dark uh, warm blue, or, or the warm blue and mixing it in with her darker color. this darker color Take some warm yellow and we'll just, because I need a little bit of green, I think down here. Too bright. So I did brighten maybe too much that background horizon. Um,
Okay, so I got uh, 10 minutes left on the clock. I think with the remaining part here, what I want to do is add a little bit of these white caps on the water. And I'm going to start with a gray. So I'm going to take my white and just take some of this gray that I had here before and lighten it up. So I don't want like the the brightest white possible, at least not f at first. Okay, now I'm just adding more white here. Like this is probably, this stroke down here is about the, the most white, the brightest white on the, on the whole canvas. Maybe this here is also... Now, as the painting, with acrylic anyway, as it dries, it's going to lose some of the intensity of the color. So I might have to go back and just add a little bit of white back on top of some of these colors. And I may even here with seven minutes remaining, just take a bit of this cool blue, go back in to the sky. Because it kind of looks to me like this cold blue was one of the final things that he added here. And I like seeing these brush strokes over top of the, like the tree, for instance. There's that purple right down the, the middle of the tree, a kind of grayish purple. I almost forgot that. So let's get this purple.
Um, okay, so I got five minutes left. Let's uh, put Tom's signature on top of here, which could be maybe the, the slowest part of the whole process. Let's, uh, I'm gonna mix, take some warm red, take some warm yellow, we've got this orange. And take some white as well. I'm just going to blow dry all of that. I'm going to write it much bigger than his, um, than he did, I mean. Two minutes and 47 seconds. Okay, a minute and 36 seconds left, let's... Nine seconds here. Let me just put...
<laughs> okay. So. to see the end of his signature so okay so there we are we've got the sketch done in one hour we're able to complete that um I'm just gonna let's just just so that I don't fiddle with it anymore. I find if I p sign it, I'm less likely to uh, do anything additionally to it. Like, it's interesting seeing yesterday's painting. Let's see. Let's put these side by side where you can see this is the, um, the sketch that we made yesterday. The Northern Lights versus today's painting the sketch for the West Wind. So both, you know, this one I spent a little bit more time on because um, we did a whole episode dedicated to that. This one obviously going much faster, um, but it does feel kind of nice to to get that experience of, of the, the intensity of moving really, really quickly. Okay. Uh, Paula says, are we done for the day? It's time to watch hockey. Uh, as far as I know, the, there's no game tonight. I thought the, the hockey game was tomorrow night because there was a game last night, right? Maybe basketball? Are you watching basketball? Maybe you're ba There's a basketball game happening, I think, right now. Uh, let's move this out of the way. So what we're going to do, or at least what I'm going to do, maybe if you want, you could certainly pause the video and come back tomorrow and watch this version, but I'm gonna just plow right ahead because what I wanna do is, remember this was the sketch that Tom Thompson made before he made this painting. And the painting changed quite a lot over the course of, uh, during that transition. So let's take a look at, just as a kind of, how did the painting change? So here's the original, here's his more refined, much larger version. In fact, as I said, I think it's probably 40 by, you know, 35 by 42, something around there. Um, kind of that big. And this is on display at, uh, I was going to say Art Gallery of, I can't, let's just take a quick look. Where, uh, this painting, It's at the, uh, yeah, Art Gallery of Ontario. So here, uh, well, that's his catalog resume. Here's the painting itself. So you can see this was donated to the museum in 1926. Canadian Club of Toronto. I don't know who that was. It is really interesting. Uh, maybe there's a discussion we'll do as we talk, but 
A.Y. Jackson and J.E.H. McDonald were really the two closest artists, uh, friends of his that were artists, both of whom became central figures to the Group of Seven, which formed after Tom Thompson died. Again, Tom Thompson was not a member of the Group of Seven, as as much as most people believe. I, I would say if you went down out on the street right now and asked, is Tom Thompson a member of the Group of Seven, nine out of ten people would say yes. But he was not. They didn't exist until after he died. He, they, they were talking about this. They, they did talk about forming a group while Tom was alive. But Tom died before the group could form. Also, Tom died in 1917. What is happening in 1917 at that exact time? World War One. A.Y. Jackson is um, recovering from uh, a gunshot wound and a shell wound that he received on the, f on the front lines. Um, and uh, got the news that Tom Thompson died while he was in England recovering from his wounds. Um, and I think the shock of, of this, of their friend, and I think they really saw Tom, even though Tom had far less training um, as a, like, he, we talked about this yesterday, Tom did do some... Uh, art classes or class or not no one's necessarily sure exactly how much training he actually had he did go to Seattle and his brother had a kind of a graphic design school in Seattle his brother George um, and so Tom did travel to Seattle stayed there I think 1902 to 1906 something around there and and it was the Acme School of Business but it was mostly like a, 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 a school that was teaching you to, uh, like to like good penmanship. A lot of it was, he did learn some design skills, but a lot of it was also just like how to be a, a, uh, a professional man, right? If you think of Seattle in 1902, it was a lot of guys who were drifters who were thinking of going to the the Klondike to, to strike it rich, and then they started hearing all the news about how all the, the parcels of land were gone, and there wasn't any money to be made, and you could, you'd spend all your life savings to get up there and realize you just ended up working for somebody else. So George was a pretty smart guy. His Tom Thompson's older brother, George Thompson, was a smart guy. I was like, huh, well, maybe, what if I establish a business school here and all the guys that have now arrived in Seattle thinking about going north, and they're like, they find this news. Let's let's uh, let's make money some other way, right? Um, I just see oh, lots of comments rolling here in the chat. Um. <laughs> Uh, so, I'll get to some of those, I see, uh, Beverly says, hi, Susan Tom, never became a member of the group of seven, uh, Cheryl says, my favorite Canadian painter, uh, Heidi says, amazing work and done within the one hour time budget. <laughs> <laughs> and then Beverly says, I love your work, Michael. I was able to see the West Wind in person. It was wonderful. I would like to send an e-transfer to help you a wee bit. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Beverly, for for your offer of helping to support the channel. Um, if you want to make a contribution, there is a PayPal link below that you can send money directly through that way. Small or large, no judgment. Every little piece helps. Uh, if you want to do an e-transfer, my email is on my website, and it's also, you can contact me through the Facebook uh, group, and the, all those links are down below. Um, I, I just I don't put my email address here on YouTube because I already get a ton of spam. <laughs> so uh, anyway, so let's move on to this next painting. I, I Thank you again, Beverly. I really appreciate that. Um, I, I often forget to to mention that um, 
because everything, all of these cameras, microphones, everything has been supported. I began this channel back uh, over a year. Well, I've, I've been uploading to YouTube for 16 years now, but I began doing these live streams back last March, uh, just using my iPhone, an iPhone and an iPad, and the people were so generous supporting. Now I've got, you know. Um, some really really great equipment to make this actually a professional <laughs> endeavor so uh okay let's let's take a look at uh the, the the finished version of the painting so uh before i went on my digression what is the difference between this painting and this painting well i mean obviously there's more detail the painting is like eight times the size so it's a much bigger painting we have a lot more surface to really get into the detail i'm going to be making my painting on the, the exact same sized canvas which is going to limit some of the amount of detail i can put in my painting um but other things he's obviously spent a lot more time clarifying things remember when i was painting my painting and i, I was like like what is going on in these branches like which branch connects to what? What's going on? Well, in this version of the painting, he, he solved those problems for for himself and for for us, the viewers, right? He's gone in and, and, um, and done that. He's also kind of made things maybe more lyrical and things kind of flow in, in a much more... Um, uh, there's a there's a very clear distinction between foreground and background right there's no confusion as to what is the tree and what is the background i mean maybe a little bit in here but even then it, these colors like this blue in the background is obviously part of the, the so there's there's really no confusion whereas here you could you could be uh, confused as to like is this blue really in the sky behind there or is that part of the tree you know are these lines is that I don't know bird or part of uh, a cloud or is that a tree branch like what is going on in the foreground it's but just a bunch of blobs of paint excuse me whereas here he's clarified what all of this these things are i mean to a certain extent they're also they're still kind of weird shapes um so there is a, a, a little bit of abstraction going on in this painting like if we were to blow up some of this it's still not exactly clear what we're looking at other things that he's doing if you look at the the these hills in the background look how there are all these big vertical lines here which is, is, you know, that's a, a, a design choice, right? That's not what those hills would look like. They, they, they look very flat, right? So it's interesting. There's this like flatness of the the background uh, hills. Even actually, as I look at this, the fl these leaves here in the trees. Like you notice how he's got these vertical lines on these on the the leaves, the foliage there. That's interesting. And then obviously he spent a lot more time on the uh, on the water in fact if we zoom back out the two areas that looks like he really dialed in his attention this time is the water and the sky and really those would be if we go back here the parts where well i was going to say that he spent the least amount of time uh, but he it looks like he did this whole painting pretty quickly so uh this time uh, let's say I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a timer for uh, two hours on on here. And ideally, oops, I'm going to try doing this painting even faster. So let's, I'm going to try to do this in about an hour and a half. And also because we did the, the this previous version of the painting, uh, I think... I think I have a pretty, I have a better idea of how I can, I've already, like the benefit of doing a sketch is it already sort of, you solve a lot of the problems the first time around. Like, in fact, just as a very small digression, today when I was writing the, the Facebook post to let people know about today's episode, I was almost ready to send or to upload it or whatever, 
and whatever Facebook glitch it disappeared. Oh, man. I spent like 25 minutes composing my thoughts and writing and deleting and moving sentences around. Oh! And then it's like, okay, I gotta rewrite this thing that's upsetting. But I wrote it in about four minutes because I'd already composed what I wanted to say. It didn't come out exactly the way I did it the first time, but there wasn't, I didn't have to do that same thinking of, of what I wanted to say. It already had already been done. So the hope is, is because that thinking has been done, I don't need to do it again. Now I'm looking at this palette and I think I am just going to take a quick second just to clean it right off. So I'll just show you what I do with my my palette before I, I clean up for the night. What I do, I'm, I don't know if I can save this red so, or this yellow. So I just kind of wipe the big areas of paint off. And then I'm gonna I'm just gonna take a quick second. I'm gonna walk over to the sink. I'm gonna I'm gonna clean this out and then uh, and then I'll be back and you'll see what this looks like in just a couple of seconds here. Okay, so there's my palette. I cleaned everything off. I've got like a little um, scrubber that I use just to help get all that off. Let's put our tags back on here. I was going to paint right over the original, and it's like, you know, it can get a little confusing. I, I, if I was just doing it myself, I would do it, but since I'm here on camera, <laughs> ostensibly teaching people what I'm doing, clarity, which is a big word we're using over and over today, it makes sense to make this as uh, straightforward as a process so people can see what I'm doing. I'm going to put all my colors back on the palette. I kind of is a bummer to throw some of those blobs of yellow and red that I had there away, but uh, being sacrificed to the to the gods of painting. I don't know what to do with those little skins. I, I, I'm just putting it there so it doesn't I don't get it on the floor or whatever, but uh, I sometimes want to save them. I know there's some artists who do just that. Okay. So, and I just need a, a bit of a hunger headache here, so. OK, 
Okay. So. How did Tom Thompson make this version of the painting? Let's just take a two minutes just to dive in, see if we can see any clues. So we already pre we prepped this canvas with this kind of off yellow, off white. It's it's a little bit um, darker color than I was thinking. I was thinking about going a little bit lighter, but that's okay. Now, as I look at this, you can see this red that he's painted on here. Now, the question in my mind, was the canvas, did he take his canvas and paint the entire thing red? Or did he paint all of these lines red on a canvas that was white? I don't know. It's interesting when we go all the way down to the bottom edge of the painting, it does look quite light, doesn't it? It doesn't... And we see these little bits of, of white coming through. So it is possible that he might have gessoed this canvas with some, like, a white ground. Can't really see up top there, can we? Um, so as far as I can tell... I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that he painted red lines on a white canvas or a, um, uh, a, you know, a canvas similar to this, right? This was, remember I showed you at the beginning of the episode, this, this is a canvas of mine, you know, that I, I build these stretchers and then I stretch the canvas on myself. It's just so super satisfying starting, like, that whole process of, of building your own canvas, stretching the canvas. One of these days I'm going to do an episode where I, where I just show how to build your own canvas, how to stretch canvas, how to prep a real canvas. Um, which is, you know, definitely not something, I, even a lot of my peers, just they buy it or they order it and have somebody else manufacture it for them. It's just, I'm, I'm a bit of a woodworker. I used to run my own carpentry business, so I had all the tools. And it's it's like a canvas like that. If you if you build it yourself, costs maybe ten dollars worth of materials. Versus if you buy something like that, it costs maybe seventy bucks, or at least. I, and I used to build those for other people and sell them, and I'd sell that to somebody for like a hundred bucks, right? Okay. So let's uh. Let's set this timer. In fact, I'm going to go to, let's do one hour and 30 minutes. We'll see how far we can get in that period of time. And if I need to add more time, I'll do that. But uh, let's just start right now. Okay. So I'm going to take, I'm going to take a bit of a smaller brush. I'm going to go right into my warm red paint. It's possible that... Yeah, I think he could be using a, a mixture of both of these. Um, but... For our purposes, it's just, I mean, we're talking such a minor... Um, I don't know. It's funny, it's one of these things where I think maybe most of the people watching this video are just like, I don't care, it doesn't make any... And then I know that there's other people who will watch this video and be like, No, we got the, the red rung! What a what a amateur hack! Uh, so you're just in the back of my mind thinking like, oh... Okay, so I've got this uh, red here. Let's now just kind of... And we can... I don't know, he may have drawn it out like this. If he did that, there might be less likelihood that he would actually take a red. So I w it wouldn't surprise me if he just had a blank canvas, took some red, and then just started to kind of sketch this out. And he would have had the original, you know, hanging on the wall next to him. Uh, 
and because he's making his final or a, 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 a better version of this he's probably moving a little bit slower now I'm putting a timer for for myself so I might move a little bit faster So the benefit of having kind of a bright color like this underneath everything is it's just like when we put the, that bright warm yellow under our painting, it, it gives things this kind of glow. We see little bits of color shining through that are, it's almost imperceptible to, to the viewer. But it influences how we see the painting. And artists love that kind of stuff. They love putting things in that affect how you see the painting, but you don't even really know that they're there or perceive them consciously. So we got this line. Like I imagine, probably this part of the, this might take me. Um, how this gonna come? Like out of my my allotted budget of time, as how he put it, like you know, maybe a, a tenth of my time. You know, it's it's like building a house or a foundation, right? It's you got to make sure that the, the structure you build is sound. Right, so if you're putting this in, you're thinking, okay, I've got to make sure I got things in the right place. So I want to move the tree over. Like he actually, you can see that he moved the tree a little bit further to the right, whereas in the original, it's it's almost right in the middle. Now some of these lines I'm putting down are kind of thick. That's not a problem because I can always thin these out. In fact, let's go right down the middle of this. If you did want to save a little bit of time, one thing you could do is just take the take a, a white canvas, draw the lines on, and then just put a red coat of paint over top of everything. I think that would also probably be just uh, you'd you'd basically get this effect that we're doing right here. It might alter some of it. Would certainly is, it would alter the other colors you've got on here but then you can also just compensate by just changing the colors you're applying on there so you can see he's he's tom thompson was he worked for like about six years at least as a graphic designer and I mean he he worked at grip limited he was responsible for uh, at least initially for transferring uh, in this complicated process uh, 
transferring photographs into um, plates that could be reproduced in like the newspaper and magazines and for advertisements. So he would, he had a lot of experience, like literally tracing over top of photographs. Um, so, you know, this idea that there's, there's certainly the big part of the myth of Tom Thompson is that Tom was like a, you know, this, you know, complete, um, how, how is it described? Like a, uh, um, like the savant, right? That he was like this farmer who came up from uh, northern Ontario uh, and he was self-taught and he just was like a genius that, that uh, amazed his friends and uh, and that's not true at all. He, he, he took, he went to design school. As I said, his brother ran a design school he so he his, he played music when he was younger so he was you know he came from a family of relatively you know um open-minded creative people a large family he had uh, i think six brothers and sisters of which he was kind of in right in the middle And because he worked for a design firm, he he would have he was very aware of how to organize an image and and how to especially if you're thinking he worked as a like starting with sketches he would take that sketch and then clarify the sketch, which would have been part of his job when he was taking photographs and preparing them for print, right? Sometimes he, you know you have to lighten or darken a photograph in order to, and then he would draw over top of it and turn it into like a uh, an, an etching. And by doing that, you remove details, add details, shift things around. Okay, so this is, I've spent 10 minutes so far doing this. Oh, and there's this little window I forgot right here through the... Oh, uh, this other side. Okay, now, I think he also, so we've got this foreground image, and we got the outline of the background. I suspect he probably would have also done a little bit of this, uh, and just kind of quickly painting in where he wanted, like, some of the major clouds to go in, cloud shapes, in the direction of these clouds. Not quite as detailed as, as what he's done here. At least I don't think that's what he would have done, but... It does make it a little confusing uh, at this point to kind of see... You know, it was a little bit more clear before I started putting these lines in the background. So I won't do too many of them, but... Uh, then you can see he's thinking of like the water kind of moving this way, whereas that wasn't in his original sketch. The water didn't seem to kind of have a particular kind of direction. So he's made a choice. I don't know if that's how they, the, the idea of the, the wind moving towards the left, towards the west. 
I don't think he titled his this painting. As I said before, previously, that um, most of his work was titled after he died. And also, you know, it, it's, it wasn't uncommon for collectors and curators to name a painting on behalf of an artist. And it still happens on occasion to these days as well. Um, okay. So that's probably good enough. So now we're at an hour and 17 minutes um, here. Um, Beverly says, hi, Beverly, or sorry, Dolores says, hi, Beverly, are you painting along today? Joshua says, is that right or wrong? I feel like that's misinformation. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what you're uh, referring to, Joshua. I mean, I hope I'm not misinforming people about something, but... Uh, Okay. So let's look at the painting again. Think what's the next step we're going to do. Now, remember I said before, one of the things I liked about his paintings is about how he worked. Um, he often would paint the background, or at least on his sketches, he would paint the... the, the, the uh, he would paint the the background sometimes in front of or, or after he painted some of the foreground elements. So sometimes we had some of the sky overlapping the trees. In this case, it looks like he did things in a, a much more traditional way in which he's painting back to front, probably back to front, back to front, and, and then ending on the front. So that, that we have lines that are on the in foreground overlapping things in the background that really create a distinction between those two uh, uh, planes or not planes um, uh, compositional elements I guess uh, so I'm gonna paint let's mix a uh, let's mix some grays he's got a lot of different kinds of gray in here which is can make things a little bit tricky if you wanted to just use black and white to mix your your paints, um, I think you you I, I wouldn't blame you. But I'm gonna I'm gonna continue kind of showing people a little bit about how how to mix a gray if you don't have black or you want a, a gray that has a little bit more life. And actually, as I look at that painting, I don't I don't even know if there is any black in that painting actually. So it is entirely possible that he's doing it exactly the way we're about to do it right now so let's take some of the warm blue let's take some cool blue let's take some cool red now we got kind of a deep deep purple let's take some cool yellow now Now we got a very muddy green uh, gray, and that's not surprising at all because we've, we've these most of the color is made up over here, right? Colors that are going to lean towards um, towards uh, you know your your green. So let's say I'm going to take a bit of warm yellow in here. And that's going to make it go much more gray. So this is, um, that's a nice dark color. 
But I don't think we need that color just yet. <laughs> a bug flying around keeps bouncing into the lights. And that sounds like a timbre or a, like a drum going off. Um, so now let's just take a bit of white and let's mix this up here. That's a pretty cool gray. <laughs> I mean, it's cool, but it's it's cool because we used three cool colors and and I guess two warm colors, so it's predominantly a cooler color, which is totally fine because I, I can see some of that in the sky already. Um, and I'm gonna so let's take that color. Now, just in terms of the time that I have here, I got an, an hour and 12 minutes um, that I've at least just set out for myself initially. I'm just gonna go for a little bit larger paintbrush. Now, we could work with a smaller brush to kind of get more of a refined look, but I just don't really have the time for that. So what I'm, I'm using kind of this mid value here actually this is a little bit more of like your the darker value in, in this painting i'm going to outline kind of the the bottom of these clouds and re remember my goal initially here is not really for much accuracy I just want to really fill in the painting as quickly as possible and then the real I think the most exciting part of the painting begins when I can then go and start altering things and, and brightening and darkening things so I'm not gonna fuss at all at least for let's say the next 45 minutes the next 45 minutes of this painting for me are, is just like a race to get as much paint onto the painting as possible. And so it's basically using the exact same kind of... I'm almost going to be painting the same way that I did the first painting, right? Very little of my approach will have changed here. So I'm just adding a little more white to that color. Overheated even with a with a ice pack on it. That's not a good sign. Oh. wasn't the camera after all it's the battery pack for communicates to the streaming deck okay Whew. I was like oh my goodness if that come on there we are so let's just In fact, if anything, I'm just going to maybe just take this middle uh, tone here and do paint a lot of this in pretty quickly. I 
I'm still trying to get the, I'm painting these brush strokes in a particular direction, because uh, that's really important. I want to capture the, 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 the essence of these clouds and how they're, you know, they're, they're moving, but I'm not so concerned about, you know, these brush strokes are probably not going to be barely visible by the time the painting is finished, right? They're going to hide underneath everything. See, there's a little bit of white or red, sorry, that's being picked up on my brush. So that paint was still wet, so that doesn't bother me in the slightest. In fact, I kind of like it. It's because uh, you see some of that in his painting. So the same thing uh, that happened in the original painting is some of the stuff in the trees starts getting a little bit confusing, right? And you're just like, oh, I'm kind of losing the, the tree branches again. I don't really know what, uh, what goes where anymore. Just keep in mind that that probably happened to him as well. But then he's, he's putting the paint in and then he's going to spend you know in his case hours clarifying it back for for himself and ultimately for us okay um think I've got the majority of what I want. If, I, if anything, what I want to do is go a little, is it's better to go to overdo it than to underdo it here. So I'm going to kind of just cutting into some of this red. So now let's move to the, I think I'm just going to go right to the water. And we can see that water is, it's like almost green actually, if, if anything. That's the primary color that I, or the, 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 the main color that I see here. So, and that green, that's actually, I'm just going to clean these brushes. It looks like mostly a, a, a warmer green. The re the reason why it looks it, there's it, it looks like a warmer green because it has a bit of like a a brownish quality. Like a cooler green tends to have like a uh, doesn't really have much brown in it. It it looks more bluish or yellowish, like cold yellow, and and can also be quite saturated of a color so um, let's m mix that let's do this up here to take some a little bit of yellow and I think I'm just gonna use this color just like that I was gonna well I might add a little bit of white because I'm probably going to have to use the same color a second time and it's going to be quite transparent so I'm probably a lot of the yellow on the painting 
it's already here we'll we'll uh kind of bleed through yeah i'm gonna add just a more white into here I got lights on on either side of me, and there's this bug that just is flying from one side to the other, bouncing into the to one light, and then goes back to the other side, bounces into that light. Kind of got a little rhythm going on here. And you know, I'm picking up some of the red that was that I put down. I don't mind that at all. Right, so this whole water is, is now kind of this greenish color. And that white in there is going to also make it a lot easier for me to paint subsequent layers over top of it. Okay. So I'm at a minute, or one hour and 50 seconds left here. Um, so I think what I want to do now is I think what I'm going to do is paint, take this darker color. Let's let's take mix a little bit of a cool green. Obviously, you'll see the the difference between like look how the difference between that green and the one that we had here before, like totally different color, right? While I've got a little bit of this on my brush, I'm just gonna put even it needs to be even brighter than that. Okay, so I'm going to take that cool green, I'm just going to mix it in with this darker color that we had earlier, right? And that darker color, just for, for reference, is warm blue, cool red, cool yellow, and I might have added a little bit of warm yellow into it, right? So basically all three of my cool colors plus warm blue and a bit of warm yellow. And paint that into these hills.
Okay. And then I'm going to take a little bit of the cool blue. And just mix this into the cool blue. Let's take a bit of this darker color mix it in there too. Although I love that color. I think it's just a little bit too intense. And then what's interesting, it looks like he's added just a little bit of white in here. And that is going to help create a bit more of a distinction. Between some of these things in the background and foreground. I added a bit too much white there. So maybe I'll just start zooming in a little bit. So we can see a little bit closer what I'm up to. Okay, I'm going to take this coldy uh, blue. Actually, I'm just going to go down to a smaller brush now. You can see these. I mean, I'm going. I'm going fast, right? Remember, he probably spent weeks on this painting. I'm trying to get it done in the next 55 minutes. Um, but one of the things that I think we we want, especially when we're painting like water, is you want to avoid straight lines, right? There's no no straight lines really in nature anyway. Um, Unless maybe you're talking about crystals and stuff, but uh, when it comes to water, we really want to help emphasize the, the fluidity of it. We want lines, marks that uh, that are like these serpentine or macaroni kind of shapes. Okay, and that's that's good. Okay, so now just gonna clean a brush off. Let's zoom back out. Like I mean, I like that the painting. Oh, that's it's crooked. That's why. Um. Just gonna clean some of these brushes. Um, I'm really happy with where I am at this point in the painting. Like we're like 40 minutes into the painting, and we've got a pretty good. Um, base for everything here. So I think while I've got all that done, let's uh, actually let's put a little bit of the cool blue into the sky. Let's take some of the white.
And, and just keeping in mind, like, which, the direction of these marks, right? The clouds are kind of coming up this way. So we want our marks to be kind of emphasizing that movement. Just while I'm here, I'll just take a little bit of this and go into the water as well. Just going to shift it down to a smaller brush. Maybe I'll just, just for the sake of, of speed, I'm just going to add a little bit of these marks. What I want to, I'm in, going to go into the foreground. I'm going to put some kind of purples and browns into the foreground, and then I'm also going to put. Once I got that brown mixed up, we're going to start doing the tree. So to get a brown, um, I need some more warm yellow. I got a warm red. I did take a bit of cool red in there just to um, give it a little bit more of a reddish brown punch. Now, he's got a lot of really gorgeous colors going on down here. I'm not going to be able to get all of that var variation, varieties of color, just because of my time limit, but um, I'll do my best. I'm also, um, I don't want to do too much detailing in here because I'm going to be painting back over top of a lot of this once I'm really finished my background.
but it is kind of helpful just to every once in a while to kind of come back here and clarify a little bit of that. Okay. Um, while I'm here, and I got this on my brush, um, I'm going to mix a purple. It's a warm yellow, cool uh, red. Got this really nice, bright purple. Let's just see. It's going to be way too purpley, but if I, I'm just going to want to fill in a bunch of space here. Just because I kind of start running behind. So we, this won't be the finished color, but gives you an idea of like how just filling it in is just, it can be really satisfying because then you can then, you know, work on, on, uh, refining things a little bit. Like, I imagine this stuff down here is probably where he had the most joy. and He was just giddy, playing around. So I want to be, I want to have that same experience. So I'm, I want to kind of get through this initial phase of painting as quickly as possible. So I'm really just almost randomly laying in these colors. to this bright red and I haven't I'm still using like the same two or three paint brushes for almost everything here and I, I haven't really cleaned my brush all that much okay I'm at 45 minutes I just wiped that paint off let's um I'm gonna go for the, a green for these, um, the branches in the foreground. So let's take warm yellow, warm blue. And I think just initially, I'm gonna paint this much brighter. Now that I'm painting this, these greens, it, it strikes me that he might have actually painted something like this. Might have been one of his first steps after painting the red. That would have made things a lot easier for him to see. Or at least he might have done that when he was painting outside. Now that I'm doing this, it's like, oh, huh. That would have, that, or at least that's probably what I would do if I was to do this painting on location.
Like, so I, I mean, what I want is like the, the building up, the accumulation of color is going to create like the, the, like this symphony of like, of, 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 of sounds and things, right? So, or of color, like, I don't want to just flat, it's not about like puzzle pieces. This color makes the exact right color, it goes boom. At least that's not the way that that I paint, and it's certainly not the way that he painted, and really most of the artists that we've looked at. But that's often the that's often what I see when I look um, at other videos by people teaching people how to paint on YouTube. But uh, you know, if it works for you, then certainly. You know, do whatever works for you. It makes you feel good, brings you joy and happiness. You don't have to do it this way. I do think it, it produces more kind of beautiful paintings. I, I think, or at least if you're paint like if you're painting from a photograph, maybe it, it helps to work that way. But if you're like I'm trying to simulate how he like the the. The, the process of all of these artists, right? As opposed to just trying to make a reproduction of it. I'm not, no, I'm not really interested in that at all. I'm, I'm mostly interested in really walking in their footsteps for as long as possible. Okay. So I feel good about all of this. Let's dive down into the water and just we got 40 minutes left so what I'm thinking what I'd like to do is probably let's get the water done let's get the clouds so this will probably take me 20 minutes this is gonna take me 20 minutes that's 40 minutes so I'll probably go a little bit over and I could see this taking me another 10 15 minutes but we'll I'm gonna try to get everything done in 40 minutes let's see if we can keep this train running oops sorry I bumped the microphone there we blew out somebody's eardrum. Okay, so I'm going to take this green that I have here. I'm going to add some water or white to it. I guess uh, maybe I should have just kept it like that. Now that I look at it, so maybe I'm going to. It's it's actually one thing that's kind of nice is if you've got a, a few colors like this already pre-mixed on your canvas, then you can just go right into using them. Um, so let's let's zoom in here. I've kind of zoomed out most of this painting. Obviously, his brush strokes are are much more deliberate and careful. Although, actually, now no, that I'm looking at it kind of quickly, uh, he he actually is probably in in this instance. It looks like he's he's some of these marks are done with with a lot of gusto. Part of like what's nice about when you're moving quickly like this is it um, it helps to kind of short circuit like the that impulse of your that you, that at least I have to 
stop and correct and make things perfect. You're just like kind of going a little bit faster than that part of your brain can process things. Let's just keep on plowing ahead here. So really, what I've I've got the colors in here. I just need to kind of fill in some of the the, the gaps here. We've got all of this this uh, these lighter colors. So I'm, what I'm just going to do is just add a little bit of darker blue to it. Maybe just darken a, a little bit more. Now that you know the goal is to, we, we don't want it as loose as the previous painting, right? We want to bring, we want it to be a little bit more refined. As much as I like how this looks right now, um, we want it to, we want to basically cover up a lot of these, this lighter green that I put down there earlier on. I'm almost done this layer. Uh, 
Um, next thing I'm going to do, I see a bit of purple and pinks in here. So I'm just going to take my brush without even cleaning it. I get a bit of cold red um, uh, with a bit of white on here. So I'm trying to get these, um, again, these little bit of, like, just quick little U-shapes. I called them macaroni shapes earlier. And also the marks closest to us are going to be bigger than the marks in behind. So right now everything's a bit of a kind of a mess. But we've got the whole surface pretty much painted in. So let's just kind of zoom out real quick. Okay, and let's just zoom back out here. Okay. Um, so now I want to bring some clarity back into here. So let's do uh, some white and green. Okay, let's zoom back in. A little bit too close. Let's go back. Okay. So now I'm just going to try to to be a little bit more careful. Sort of bringing some order back into the painting from all this chaotic brush strokes that we had there. And the, the marks in the background are going to be little tiny dabs of paint. And then as we get closer, Not a lot of that same color over here, so... Okay, so now I'm going to just take... I need some more cool blue on my palette. I'm going to put some cool blue into the same color and get it a little bit more... Um, you know, just, it's kind of turquoise-y, emerald -y kind of color.
Oops, let's move this over. And so the, the right side of the painting had had kind of much kind of smaller dabs of paint over here as we weren't trying to get the the look of these waves and to be honest I'm moving so fast I don't have too much time to really look too carefully at, at all these gorgeous marks he's made here so um, I like this color, this yellowy color he's using. You know what's even kind of nice? It looks like he's got a shadow from a, a cloud or something passing over the middle part of that painting. That's really beautiful. So if we want to try to get a bit of that, I'm just going to go back to some warm blue. It's a little bit too dark, isn't it? Okay, so I'm about four minutes left from what I, I said I was going to take uh, 20 minutes to do this. So let's, I'm just going to plow right ahead and go right to, I need a little bit more cool. Taking some cool blue and white. You can just see that there's just dozens and dozens of little different colors that he's put in here that just make that painting come alive. It's gorgeous. All right, let me take a tiny bit of cool yellow in here. Cool blue and white.
Okay, now I'm just going to put the white caps on here. So I'm taking mostly just white, a little bit of blue, I suppose. I don't know, there's so many other colors in there I'd love to have, but I just don't have the time, so... Ah, what? That out of the way, there we go. I want to be careful about getting too white as I go further into the background. And with these lines, I'm just going to make these a little bit more just horizontal. Quick, tiny, short, horizontal marks. I might have to just wait for some of that paint to dry. It's still pretty wet and I'm just mixing wet paint in there, so it's sort of not worth my time to continue that for right now. Okay, so uh, let's, uh, okay, that's, I went three minutes earlier, that took me 23 minutes, so let's pick up the pace a little, and see if we can make up some time in the sky here. Um, what I want to do with the sky is I'm going to take a bit of my, cool, my, my warm blue and cool blue, I'm just going to mix these together a little bit. Take a bit of white as well. Oops, let's go.
just mixing a bit of white in there. Maybe that's too much. I'm just going to continue with whatever this blue is on my brush here before I move on. in here so let's let's mix a purple let's take our like just take this warm blue cool red blend that together Put a purple and I don't see any purple just on its own so it's kind of modified with some white so Purple, right? I mixed here. Whenever possible, like if you've got like a tree like this, you want to try to carry like a paint stroke across behind the the tree so that it stays consistent. So you don't get one side of the tree is like oh perfect okay now let's do this and you're like oh how did i do that right so just kind of be a little mindful of that kind of stuff it's a little tricky sometimes but uh if you don't you can kind of make for some weird things especially with like backgrounds And again, there's lots of beautiful colors here that I see in these clouds that I just, uh, it just kind of breaks my heart that I won't be able to, to get there, but uh,
I like every time I look at it, I'm like, oh, I see now some green in the sky. Oh, no, there's some pinks. Oh, there's some yellowish colors. So, um, let's try to get a bit of green in here. This is my uh, cool blue, cool yellow, a little bit of um, white in there, and my dirty brush too, right? So, I'm, especially at this kind of stage, I'm just letting my brush stay a little dirty. Often I find if I keep, it's not because I'm lazy, it's because if I keep cleaning my brush all the time, then I end up having like these colors that are just too loud and, and, um, Whereas if I have, if I'm painting with the same kind of dirty brush, those colors, they tend to just integrate a little bit better into the overall composition. They're not so kind of just glaringly out of like space aliens landing on the painting. Okay, so I've been working on that side for a while. Before I go too much further, I don't I don't know if I'll have too much time to go too much further there. I want to take these same colors that I've been playing with and spread them out onto this side. Just like I said, again, I don't want to have one side that looks one way and has a whole bunch of different colors that aren't in the other one. So... So I'm definitely inventing a, a few things here, just out of time. I, I just I'm worried I won't be able to get um, every all those colors in there. So I'm just kind of using some of the colors I do have and putting those around on canvas. So I'm gonna come back, I'll do a little bit of purple back into here. This little green that I'm. Oh, do I do that? Okay. The other thing that he's got is a little bit of this brown going on. And I have a bit left here that hasn't dried up. So I'm just going to take some of this color. Right, so I'm kind of mixing a couple. I got a few different versions of it that I can dip into as I paint. Um, ooh, it's a little bit intense, right? So let's just modify it with a bit of purple.
So I'm just going to get a little bit more of this done, and then we'll do some white into the, like, pretty strong white, um... It's got these going in a different direction here. Okay, so now I'm just going to start getting going brighter and brighter with white. Okay, so I've got a minute and 55 seconds left on my clock from that hour and a half that I set out for myself. Obviously, I'm not going to be done in two minutes here. I'm going to I'll, I'll, I'm going to keep on painting until I finish, but it gives you just an idea that this painting is now taken an hour and a half, whereas the other one took me uh, one hour to finish. So I've already worked on this for an, a half hour longer than the other one.
I can't wait to see these Tom Thompson paintings that people are are going to make roll in and, and uh, should be super interesting. So just as a quick little thing, like usually the tops of of your clouds are the are the brightest parts of them, because and then the bottom part is is the shadowier side. I know it sounds probably pretty straightforward, but you you know it's it's often hard to to uh, to clouds are really hard to paint. Like maybe I should I don't yeah I got I think of a painting that is like all about clouds that we could paint. Uh, just the last thing, I'm going to take some, oh, that's got too much, well, actually, a bit of green's okay, but. Some. Just some, uh. I guess this is, I didn't intend to put green in there, but I think it actually works out really nice. This is warm, or sorry, cool yellow and white. And I think there's a bit of cool um, blue in there as well. So this works really well for the, just the light in behind the horizon here. Okay, I think that's all I can spend on that. Uh, I am gonna. I, I do want to go back to the water because I because basically once I'm done this, I'm gonna do the the hills on the backside, and then um, we'll do the trees and then foreground and we're done. So, oh, I bet you that's pretty annoying. That was that going off <laughs> this whole time. Uh, let's see. I'm just going to add 30 minutes to my clock here.
Okay. So let's zoom out, just do a little check in, see where we're at. Oops. Um, let me just take a, a second here. I need to. Well, there's a lot of comments. I didn't even see all these comments coming in here. Uh, Heidi says, this is a speed painting class. So different from what we usually do. I have a lot to catch up to do. So far, I have done more watching than painting. <laughs> I, am, I am going a little bit faster, for sure. Because um, there is, you know, trying to do these two paintings in one session is, is a little bit crazy. Um, but, of course, you can always pause... I, I don't mean to be giving, making people anxious as we do this. Um, uh, Lori says, came late, so you may have already answered this. Did he do any blending? Great question. I, I, I don't think he did that much. I mean, there he is doing a lot of mixing on the canvas. Like, he's painting often wet on wet. He's painting with oil paint. And with oil paint, you can, like... I think he's he's doing a lot of the mixing rather than on his palette. He's doing a lot of it on the canvas. But in terms of the kind of blending that we've done in some of our previous paintings, especially kind of the more classical paintings, um, no, not much that I can. I'm trying to think of a lot of his paint. I I don't think so. I mean he. Uh, He's very inspired by, you know, the Impressionists, or at least a lot of... Tom, Tom, it's it's hard to really know what he knew about painting and what other artists he was aware of. Again, there's virtually no letters or uh, information. All we have is, like, secondhand information of what other people said he said, and much of that is just there's contradictions after contradictions. Some people said, like there's just a, 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 an example of it would be there's there are people who talk about him being uh, a, like a, a really sweet, nice guy who was, um, you know, bare, like who was a, a teetotaler, didn't drink, that he was uh, always very pleasant to be around, uh, like just the sweetest guy next door that you've ever met. And then there are reports from other people, some of the people that were known to to spend a lot of time with him in Algonquin Park, who were former lumber uh, men, former lumberjacks, uh, people who worked on the lumber mills that were in Algonquin Park, who said like, "Oh man, that guy was a was a huge drinker, and he would get in you know we would get in fights, fist fights together, at, you know, at, by the campfire and." You know the the you just peep, you know black eyes the next day and uh, and he there's and other people would say they just saw him deep like descend into these incredibly deep depressions where he'd just be he would trash all his work throw them into the fire so like how do you make sense of of basically it sounds like you're talking about two different people now I will say most of us have kind of two sides to ourselves, right? There's sides that we might show to our grandmother that we might have a different side that we show to our friends when we're at the pub or whatever, right? Or we have a side that goes to church and then the other side that uh, is gambles or, you know, everyone has their own, you know, the things that, you know, people compartmentalize different parts of their life. So it's, is it surprising that there were some people that saw this very, uh, you know, uh, cheerful fellow when he's buying groceries, you know, and supplies before he goes on his new trip versus other people who saw him 
you know, at a despondent, almost suicidal level at other times, drinking himself, you know, until he passed out. Like, I don't know. It's, it's, it's so hard to, he's, I mean, he's the perfect, per like, there's a whole book, I think I have it here somewhere called Inventing Tom Thompson. And it's really all about how he's the perfect person for other people to, um, uh, to, to use as their, uh, to hold up a shining light to, like, cer certain people who want to say that he's, you know, the, uh, like, another example would be, certain people say he was, like, the, the wilderness man, that he was the greatest fisherman that anyone had ever seen, the greatest camp cook that anyone had ever seen, and then there were other people who say the exact opposite, that they, that he was just, like, a fumbling city kid, and, constantly flipping his canoe like I, I don't know how you you square like literally the exact opposite um uh information it's just it's 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 which is why it's been very hard for me to make this biography that i'm working on um uh, deborah says hi there i have been in and out and I have had some actual work to do. I'm looking forward to doing some of these later. I cannot understand why life gets in the way of my painting. Tell me about it. It's hard. Uh, Deborah also says, Rick did an amazing job of the Northern Lights painting. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait. I haven't been on the Facebook page for a little bit, so. Um, Lori says, I know what you mean. I haven't been able to paint for a week. It's frustrating. <laughs> yes, Lori, it's frustrating, says Deborah. And A says, uh, I like my second painting more than the first one thanks michael it's so much fun awesome well i would i would ex it wouldn't surprise me that the second version of the painting you make is a better painting um just because you've learned all the lessons you need in the first one and then you apply those lessons to the second one okay enough chat michael let's do the background So I still, um, let's finish off these mountains. We'll move on to the tree foreground done in, I got 20 minutes on the clock that I've put for myself. I don't think I'll get there, but I know this is one of the longer episodes, but we have done two paintings and we're working on the most famous painting in Canadian history. So, um, So these, I'm going to now put, um, so wipe that off real quick. Didn't like how I started that, so let's just try it again. So I'm putting these kind of vertical lines here. take a bit of uh, I'm gonna, the same dark color let's mix in some cool blue in there Just for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to make this one big hill. Okay. 
he's got a few different hills crisscrossing in behind there I just I don't I can't uh, get all that that detail in here today so and his painting is much larger than mine so I'm just gonna do what I can right um, This is interesting what he's doing here. Okay. Um, I think there's a, some of these colors in the foreground, so just I'm just gonna take some of this darker color that I've been using in the background and think about where I can put this. So yeah, tons of little things in here that So he's got all these these tiny little brush I mean th again he's painting this in his studio in Toronto and um, so what what is he looking at for reference for this right there's no none of these details are in the original painting so is he looking at a photograph did he make some a sketch he didn't really leave very many sketches on paper. Almost all of his sketches were, were oil sketches on canvas or, or plywood. So, you know, it's it's kind of interesting to think like, what? I mean, is he just inventing all of this from his imagination? I don't know. I have no idea. So, like him. I'm just, or like I imagine, I think he's might have done is I'm just. These that might be a little bit bright.
So this is I'm a little bit, I'm just kind of make, making a bunch of stuff up here. Just having a good old time. have to just move right to the the tree because I think that might is gonna help clarify some of the stuff down here. It's a little confusing. Okay, so I'm going to tidy all that up when I'm done the trees, or tree, I mean. Um, so where should we, uh, in fact, maybe I'm going to blow dry this, just because i got a bunch of wet paint at the bottom. But I'm pretty happy with where we're at. So I'm thinking to myself, what color do we want to do next? I think I'm going to do some warm red. I'm going to take a bit of the cool red and mix this in here. i got a bit of brown left over. I'm probably going to have to mix more brown. but I just want a, a darker red, but not... Like, I want a, a, a red, but I don't want like a pop red. So let's let's go up here. I 
Now it's a bit of a wide brush stroke. Let's it doesn't even go that way. Okay. So my primary goal right now is to tidy up the lines in the on the tree. And really push the background behind the tree, like so that kind of a brush stroke that's right now sitting in front of the tree. That was fine in our sketch that he did, um, our version of the sketch, but on this one it's got to go back. It's too, it's kind of confusing, right? Okay, so I see a, a little bit of a problem that I've created for myself is that it gets a, it's a little bit too wide in the center, which means, you know, the widest part of the tree is at the bottom, right? So if you go too wide up top, then everything below it's got to get wider and wider and wider. So you got to be a little bit careful of that. Um... I'm going to try just to keep it about that same width as it goes down, but it just means everything else just has to keep getting wider. So, I mean, I could fix that just by painting more paint in the, like, just paint the sky back in there, but that just is, that would take time. I mean, maybe he did that at times where if he made that same sort of mistake... a bit of outlining. warm red on my palette.
Obviously, this tree branch just keeps getting thicker and thicker. Uh. I'm gonna come. I think I'll work my way back up to the top there. Let's, uh... So we're going to clarify some of this here in a moment when we, we're going to do another layer of, of darker brown, um, sometimes inside, sometimes outside. mixed a little bit of warm blue into this color to get it a bit of a darker red almost brown detective work also looking back at the his original painting just to see if I can line up some of these details I mean, he must have had fun when he was doing this, because this is some weird stuff that he's 
Like it's, would just drive you absolutely nuts trying to paint some of this stuff, right? So I think he's just like having a bit of a a laugh. Like how, like, let's see this branch. having to be careful not to get my wrist in the painting. I have to do little touch-ups in the water as I've in the sky, but uh, I'll try to keep that to a minimum. I don't know how many of these wild branches I want to do here, just because it's just going to take me forever and. I don't need to get all of them in there. I think that we, once we understand that there's a bunch in here, like that's that's enough. So what is there any glaring ones that I'm going to be sitting on the couch looking at this, going, ah, I can't believe I forgot that. Okay, I think that's good enough. Let's now um, and make um, this a bit of a lighter color here. Maybe I'll just take my warm yellow. So this is warm yellow. I think this is a brown that I made earlier, which is warm yellow, warm red, and warm blue with maybe a touch of white in here and now it can kind of just go over top of in fact I think I need just to blow dry this because I'm painting this wet paint on here so
bit of a wider brush just to speed this process up. Okay, and then he's got a little bit of gray that he's painted a bit on top of, of the, these as well. So, uh, do I have any white left here? I need a little bit of white. Getting close. I, I'd say, oops, is there an alarm going off? That must be annoying. 30 minutes and we'll be done by then for sure. So again, I'm taking my dark color, which was made with uh, warm blue, cool blue, cool red, cool yellow, and a little bit of cool, um, uh, or a little bit of warm yellow. And I'm just using my the brush that I just used for this brown color so that I can paint... Some of these lines in here. It's interesting that these lines that he's putting on here, this kind of gray over top, it is, I like that a lot. Not would not have been something I would have immediately gone for. And I'm also just mixing a bit of, it was a little bit too intense, so I just added a bit of uh, the same, this light brown color into the gray. So now, really, what's left is the bottom of the painting, and then the the the, the foliage on the tree. Let's back it out one more time. So the, these leaves that we're about to put on there, that's going to really solidify this painting. Because right now there might be a little bit of... It, this, this tree looks a little bit... It doesn't have the, the presence that his does yet, right? Because he's got those these dark leaves on there. So... Uh, let's get some more warm yellow. I, hopefully this is some of the last paint we put on this palette. Ooh, okay. Um, 
It's going to take a bit of warm blue. Let's mix this a little bit over here. Take a bit of cold blue and mix this in here. Got a bit of this darker color we've had for a while. I'm surprised it's still staying wet. We haven't used any slow dry medium, so it must be cooling down here in the studio, which is a relief. Okay. And I'm gonna go to my smaller brush. Actually, I'm gonna blow dry this again real quick. Ah! Came unplugged. So let's let's kind of work our way down from the top. He's it looks like in fact let's zoom in on both. It does look like he's doing these vertical lines on these trees as well. <laughs> okay. Uh, there are lots of, again, lots of little colors spread throughout um, the foliage here. Obviously, you know, I'm trying to get this done as quickly as possible. I'm not going to be able to do all of this justice, but...
Okay. And actually, this is... I don't like how thick this is, so I'm just going to paint that branch out, right? It makes it slightly different than his, but it helps solve the problem where I was a little bit too heavy-handed on the... <laughs> on that part of the painting. Um, so let's... So I'm immediately making my. I'm aware that I've made a bit of a an error here. Th this thing in the foreground should be darker than the mountains in the background. So I can make this darker, then go back and lighten that up, or I can just try to get the painting done. So I think I'm just going to do that and kind of invert it a little bit with at least a warm color in the foreground. I think what I'm going to do in order to make that work, I'm going to use some just uh, warm blue as like an out as on top of that, and I think that should uh, help make those these leaves. It looks yeah, it needs to be darker, doesn't it? Darn it. Okay, I'm going to blow dry that.
In fact, you know what? I'm. This is. Th so this is here's. What I'm going to do is. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little bit. I'm going to take a bit of black. Uh, because the black is going to really help make this. These this part of the the painting pop forward. I need it to be darker. So that my options really would be to to go back in and kind of gray it out. I could do a glaze on here, but Tom didn't really use glaze meth that that's a uh, that method. So by going in and adding black into here, it's gonna pull these. Um, yeah, that instantly. Whoa. You gotta be careful about how much you put in there, but it, uh, all of a sudden, these are now definitely sitting much closer to the surface of the painting than they were just minutes, a second ago, right? And it's very convincing. Like, I think it might be a little bit hard to see when we're all zoomed in like that. Okay, so what is left to do really is the bottom and any kind of touch-ups. So my tree looks a little bit too red and too bright. So, uh, I, hmm. The thing with using some black like that is now I'm kind of committing to having to darken a bunch of stuff elsewhere in this painting. So to solve one problem, you sometimes create other problems for yourself. Uh... Okay, just throwing some reds around in the foreground. Like I'm tempted to glaze a little bit on on the tree here with just a little bit of a 
um, a dark red to help uh, unify the composition. Even though it's not what Tom did, I think I might be forced to do that. I mean, I, I could obviously just... Um, can, you know, mix new colors and paint everything darker, but the fastest option would be to glaze. Um, Just putting a bit more white back into the horizon. It also allows me to clean things up just a tad. Ah, okay, almost done.
I'm trying to decide if I do actually want to glaze anything or not, or if I can just live with the painting as it is. I feel like I want a little bit of more green back in the foreground. I always have to think like, okay, you know, eventually this painting, I won't have, well, very quickly, I won't have the original anywhere near while this thing is hanging. So do I, does it, can I, do I like the painting as, as it is, not as in comparison to the original? Um, that's always, that's the, that's the thing. Trying to thin that tree out a bit. That's a bit of a. Um, Michael, I don't know what you're doing. That's see, this is usually, you know, it's this is like all the accidents happen when you get pretty close to home, right? So that's not something I'm too happy with. I think I am gonna. I need to 
blow dry all this and then I'm going to go in and just glaze a little bit with a darker brown over top of some things just to bring a little bit of the detail in here. Although, you know, as I'm thinking about it, instead of glazing it, I think I'm just because it's just so unlike his process. Let's just uh, take some of this warm blue and cool red. Make a really, like a darker red. Like warm, warm blue and warm red they won't make purple, they're gonna make like a, a brown, right? And maybe I'll just snag a little bit of black in here. Okay. So for some finishing touches, I'm just looking for clues in this painting. Oh, we can't see what we're doing, can you? Um, This is making me feel immediately much, much better. And I think it's a better solution than, than glazing just to, to quickly darken everything down. Darn it. Okay.
This is going to take me another 10 minutes. I was hoping to be done by 9 here, but I think it's, it is making a huge difference. It's making me feel a lot better about some of these details. So, you, so there is a little bit of an outline there. I just kind of did the under part of that. Um, I'm just going to turn this around real quick. way better wow that's really made a huge difference It is, uh, and it's it's he's it's not like I'm inventing anything that he didn't do. He did it all himself. I just was a little bit. I was kind of hoping I could get away with not having to do it, right? Um, So just in my mind now, I'm just thinking, can I walk away? Let's zoom out. I, think I do have to walk away anyway, just in terms of my time. I missed our daughter's bath, which is my favorite part of the day. Or my, it's not. She's she had a bath. My wife is just finished giving her a bath. I could hear upstairs, but okay. It's not like she's sitting there by herself upstairs. Um, okay. Uh, I do need. To quickly Okay, I think that's that's good. Do I need? It's always every time I look at it, there's a little thing like, "Hey, are you okay?" I gotta.
Okay, I think it's not going to get <laughs> appreciably any better from this point forward. That's a little bit too crazy down here though, isn't it? Okay, I gotta walk away, otherwise I'll be at this all night long. Whew. <laughs> so let's um, let's wrap up. You know, so we've been painting for five hours. Um, well, less than five hours, probably about four and a quarter hours. I do a lot of chatting, right? So the kind of moment of um, that we've been waiting for here is to see these two paintings side by side and to think about what the difference is between them. So let's see, let's create So have, we'll just move these down here. I, I, I get like, I want, <laughs> want it nice and perfect, all lined up like that. Okay, wow, that is so interesting seeing these two great paintings, our versions of them, uh, side by side. So we can kind of finally compare them. Um, You know, I, I, I could definitely see some people who prefer this one over this one. I would, I would say probably most people would, would prefer the more refined version than the kind of the quickly painted sketch. Um, it is re it's really, I, I, it's almost like they're two very different paintings. Um, I, like I, there's definitely aspects of both of them that I, I appreciate. If there were the same price at like a gallery, which one would I buy? Would it be A or B? Um, I don't know. You know, let, let's. Uh, I'm gonna put a piece of tape here as well. We'll let. Uh, people as time goes on tell us which one do you think is better which one do you do you, uh, if you could buy one which one would you buy and I would I would see the same thing about your own paintings 
Which one do you feel more confident about, more satisfied about? Which one did you learn more about while you were painting it? Is it A or B? Hmm. Personally, I think it's really interesting having done these two experiences back to back, having had the experience of painting the sketch and then going into the final painting. I mean, I wish we could do this every single painting we did. We do is to do a quick little sketch even faster than an hour, maybe even on a small canvas. And that's that's often what a lot of artists do is they they do um, a small sketch on a small canvas work out some of the compositional uh, uh, work out the composition start kind of thinking about where colors are going to be where the, the major color contrast and relationships are going to be like because you can see that he moved this tree off to this because this area right here is a little bit of a dead area there's not a lot going on here and he could have put another you could have invented something and put a, another tree there or a branch or something hanging down here but he just made the decision to kind of shift this tree from here to like here right and that does make a big difference I think that that is a positive very positive change um, from this one to this one um, but there is the the energy that this one has that this one doesn't quite have this obviously looks like I've labored over it for a period of time so uh, <laughs> so, okay. I think that takes me to the end here. Thank you everyone for sticking around. Those of you that have, that have been painting with me the entire time. Congratulations. I would love to see what you've created. Um, I mean, obviously, I'm. It's exciting for me and very satisfying for me to make these paintings, but um, as a teacher, it's always really interesting to see if I've done my job well enough that other people can follow along and and make something that they can also feel proud of. So I would love it if you uploaded your version or versions, if you did both, to the Facebook group. And if you haven't joined the Facebook group, do it now. Go there right now. There's a, it's, I think it's the first thing in the video description below. Go check that out. Um, if you want to leave a, a comment, that's awesome. Or if you want to leave a comment on a previous video, those are really helpful to help increase the rankings of the video. We're going to do another painting tomorrow. We are going to be painted tomorrow at, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. It's, a, it's not our regular time, and it's not our regular day. It's, um, so if you want to join me for that, we're going to be painting kind of a very, the, probably the most colorful Tom Thompson painting that he ever, well, there's a there's competition for that, but uh, it's one that I really like a lot. And, um, yeah, if you want to leave a, a donation, there's a PayPal link below, or you can contact me through email or through the Facebook group. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Um, thank you to Tom Thompson for making these great paintings that have given us an opportunity to paddle a little bit in your paddle strokes, in your wake. We, we can we can paddle a little bit in your in the wake of your canoe. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, um, and thank you, everyone out there. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We will see you again tomorrow. Good night, everybody.